Well, welcome to the consulate. Uh, I see that uh, everybody is uh, coming in, and um, so uh, it's really a, a pleasure to host you all uh, for this virtual conference. I hope that uh, every attendee and uh, all of our participants today uh, are very well, and especially in good health, of course. Um, today we will have the, the privilege of uh, hearing Mr. Thomas Philippon. Uh, he's going to tell us about his view on the public health catastrophe that we're living through and uh, how it is likely to affect the global economy, whether it will lead to more or less concentration among the biggest firms, and whether we can expect to return to the pre-crisis levels of growth and prosperity anytime soon, as we are all eager to, to figure out. We had already planned to hold this conference before the COVID-19 crisis broke out, but we feel it is more timely than ever, as you know. Um, and uh, Mr. Philippon published the, the Great Reversal, uh, How America Gave Up on Free Markets Last Year. So uh, in this book, he showed that uh, whereas up until the 1990s, most US markets were competitive, today, one industry, one industry after the other, um, is dominated by a small number of mega corpor corporations. So while Philippon's analysis mainly applies to the United States, the COVID-19 crisis has led countless small and medium-sized business across the world to go bankrupt and go out of business, making his, in, his insights sorry, essential to understanding the new post-COVID global context as well. Um, Thomas, Thomas Philippon is the Max Heine Professor of Finance at the Stern School of Business in the, at New York University. He was named one of the top 25 economists under 45 by the IMF, and he won the Bernasser Prize for Best European Economist. So he currently serves as an academic advisor to the Financial Stability Board and to the Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Research. Today, um, as our moderator, we have the great honor to have El Neil Irvin. Neil is a senior economic correspondent at the New York Times, where he writes for a segment entitled The Upshot. And this segment provides vital, timely, and accessible economic analysis for non-specialists. Uh, thank you very much, Neil, for making this uh, all available to, to all of us. Um, a great service. Um, Neil is the author of the Alchemist, Three Central Bankers and the World on Fire, about the efforts of the world's central banks to combat global, global financial crisis. And it was published by the Penguin Press in 2013. And that's just one among the others is, uh, is very insightful uh, books. So once again, welcome to the consulate. Uh, thank you for being with us and, uh, and sharing the knowledge understanding better the world ahead. And uh, now I will give the floor to Neil Irvin. Neil, it's really up to you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, hello, bonjour. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. Uh, you know, I... This crisis forced the world economy and, and had uh, lasting effects. Uh, I never thought that, that that would turn out to be the less important economic event of, of my career and my adult life. Um, the, the events we're seeing tied to COVID-19 are going to have long ripple effects throughout the world economy, throughout the world uh, business. Uh, I think we'll see uh, some massive number of business failures. We're going to see uh, mass unemployment in many countries, potentially for, for some time. Uh, and we're going to see extraordinary efforts, we already are, from the world's governments to try and deal with that, from the central banks, from the fiscal authorities in different countries. And, uh, you know, the fact that we're in this transformative economic experience again, of course, the public health story is more important and, and more important to getting out of this crisis. Uh, but I think this is an economic reality that's going to, to haunt the world economy and the world uh, political system for a very long time. Uh, to help us make sense of that, we have a perfect person. Uh, Thomas Philippon, you heard the introduction. Uh, as you heard, he's the author of The Great Reversal, How America Gave Up on Free Markets, which argues that many of the problems in the US economy are the result of corporate power becoming more concentrated and markets becoming, in effect, less free and uh, competitive, more oligarchical. Um, uh, we're uh, going to begin with uh, Thomas. He'll give a presentation of, of, of his ideas. Uh, I will then question him for a while. Uh, after that, I will invite any of you to uh, indicate you would like to ask a question by uh, giving a reaction using the reaction button. 
Uh, when we get to that phase, I will uh, will call on those who have requested you can then unmute yourself. Uh, so let's begin. Toma, tell us uh, what's on your mind. Well, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much, Neil, for uh, uh, agreeing to participate. Thank you, the consulate, for organizing. Unfortunately, you know, this was an event that we were supposed to do live. In fact, we were hoping to do it with my good friend, uh, Thomas Piketty, who uh, was supposed to visit us. But, you know, uh, we don't have a choice, so now we're doing it uh, remotely. Uh, but um, it's great to be with you. I think it's, uh, we already have more than 100 people uh, online, so thank you all for coming. And uh, I'm going to give you a very, very short overview of the book, so less than 10 minutes, and then we can have an open uh, discussion. Um, so the book is called The Great Reversal, uh, and I chose the title because it corresponds to my experience in the US. I arrived here about 20 years ago as a student, and um, you know, on a small budget, I was paying attention to prices, and quickly I re realized that many uh, goods and services were cheaper in the US than they were back at home in France uh, or London, where I was coming from at that time, actually. Uh, so it was strikingly cheaper in the US to get access to internet, to buy a computer, or soon enough to buy a cell phone, and then a cell phone plan and everything, okay? It was also much cheaper to fly around uh, to the point where, as a student, I, would, I did something I would never have dreamt of doing as a student in Europe, which is to take the plane to a conference as opposed to drive with a bunch of friends or take the bus or something like that. This didn't happen by chance. This happened because the US had uh, deregulated, smartly deregulated many of its markets to make them more competitive. And by competitive, we just mean consumer friendly, right? Uh, which means consumers get good choice and good prices. So this is the US I discovered 20 years ago. And much to my surprise and somewhat to my dismay, uh, this is no longer true. In fact, the opposite is true. Today, the US consumers face the worst prices in the world by far in most markets. So I'll just give you one example because this one hits close to home because this is the market where, where the US really had a lead over Europe. It was much cheaper to walk on the internet, to walk online, to access internet uh, in uh, 1999 than, than in, in Europe. Today, it's not that the US has lost its edge and Europe has caught up, it's that it's twice more expensive in the US relative to the rest of the world, okay? So the US went from being a leader to being not even like a follower, but like way back, okay? So to give you a sense, every rich country in the world today uh, offers broadband services for its uh, citizens at somewhere between 30 and $40 per month, okay? That's for a broadband connection. The US uh, is at $68 per month, okay? Uh, so it's like twice as expensive as pretty much every other uh, developed nation. And that didn't happen by chance. This is the evolution of the telecom industry. Uh, you can see this is where I arrived around 2000, at the sweet spot where the markups in green were low, and then concentration was low as well. For the following 20 years, you have this steady rise in concentration and a steady rise in markup. So the concentration here measures the market share of the top eight firms. That went up by you know, something like 30%, which is a massive change. And the prices or the markup of the, of the price of our cost went also up by something like 30 or 40%. Today, that's why US consumers get literally ripped off by their telecom uh, providers. Uh, this is true across the board. This is not just in the telecom industry. So this is the profit margin of uh, business, uh, corporate businesses in the US, non-financial because banks, the accounting is a bit different, so I, I use the non-financial sector here. So you can see the profit margins of businesses fluctuate around 7% uh, post-war period uh, until about 2000, and now they fluctuate around something like 10%. Of course, they are cyclical, right? Every time there's a recession, profits go down, um, but clearly they are moving around the higher mean today. Um, now, so these facts are not too controversial, but their interpretation is very much controversial because some people argue that, well, concentration is good, but that means that the good businesses are getting better and they are better. Therefore, they take away market shares from the losers. And therefore, you, what you measure is the outcome of an efficient reallocation towards the best firms. Uh, and some people argue, well, no, it's the other way. It's the, the, the big firms have become really good at preventing anybody from coming and threatening their markets. And therefore, they can get away with bad service and high prices. Part of the reason people keep arguing back and forth is because this good concentration and bad concentration story are both true to some extent. They just apply to different sectors. So if you look at 
the retail and wholesale trade sector in the US, it clearly fits the good concentration story better. Okay, because there we have dominant firms, but they got dominant by just being better, by doing massive investment in intangible uh, activities, intangible assets, becoming very productive. And then you have the other extreme. If you look at the telecoms, as I showed you earlier, the airlines or the healthcare system, then clearly the dominant firm didn't get dominant by being better than the rest. Uh, they got there and instead they are by preventing anybody from threatening their, their market shares by consolidating, by merging. So both stories are true. What I show in the book is that even though you still see some good concentration in the US today, the bulk of the concentration going on is of the bad type. Okay, so it's a bit like the usual good, good versus bad cholesterol uh, story, which is, uh, I'm not saying that the good concentration has disappeared. I can, in fact, I show a few examples where it's still going on. But if you look at the big picture for most industries today, in all likelihood, when you see concentration, is driven by the wrong reasons, by barriers to entry, and it comes together with lower uh, quality of service and higher prices. Um, what's interesting is that in Europe, it somewhat went the other way. Okay? So in Europe, we started from a baseline where markets were quite concentrated, there was not much competition, and there were very strong barriers to entry. And it was partly by design, because many policymakers believe that the state should be running the economy, the state should be deciding which firm should operate in which market. And there was no notion of free entry. They also thought that consumer uh, welfare is great, but the more important stuff is to have national champions. Okay? So these ideas were very much present in Europe until the 1990s. Uh, and then something changed. And we realized that while there is some validity in the idea that the state should in invest in strategic industries, you know, it was also a very good idea to have competition. And in fact, more often than not, competition was the right answer. So we started removing regulations. This is an index of product market reforms in the EU. Um, and you can see this is the, telling you that on average, between the mid-90s and the mid-2000, we had one major product market reform per country per year on average. Now, these reforms are wide-ranging. Okay? All different types of reforms are happening. Uh, so I want to highlight one example, just to be very clear uh, and concrete. So this is the telecom industry in France. And this is, how, this is the story of how France went from being more expensive than the US to being much, much, much cheaper. Okay. Uh, and it's a story of one firm, essentially. It's a story of one firm entering the market. Uh, it was free mobile. So uh, historically, we had three uh, wireless uh, mobile operators in uh, France, three legacy carriers. It was a classic oligopoly. They were coordinating their prices so that everybody was offering the same contract at the same price. And there was not much competition. Um, and then there was a force carrier, free mobile, uh, who wanted to enter that market. But to enter this market, of course, you need a license and you need some spectrum. Um, and so for a long time, for most of the 2000s, they got denied their uh, license to enter the market under heavy lobbying by the three incumbents who understood the threat. And then in 2011, they lost. And free got the license free entered the market. <clears throat> and it didn't ent enter the market 5% below the other guys, or 10%, or 20%. It entered 15% below, right? The benchmark contract for free text messaging, unlimited messaging, plus a bunch of data at the time, around 2011, was 40 euros per month. Free entered for the same exact contract at 20 euros per month, okay? Um, so of course, they started getting market shares. The three incumbents realized something was happening, and therefore, they started to get their acts together, lower their prices, Two years later, everybody was at 20 euros per month, which means that if you were a basic consumer like my parents, who are not tech savvy, who are not shopping around, um, their contract went down in price without them having to do anything. Okay, now this is how capitalism is supposed to work. Competition brings prices down and everybody benefits. Um, and you can see on this, like the, the, the impact is just so big that it jumps at you when you look at the data. Um, it's true more broadly. So this is one summary of what's going on in Europe over the past 20 years. Each green dot is one country in Europe. The red line is the US. And this is a measure produced by the OECD where they just build indexes of uh, regulations, barriers to entry. So the higher you are, that means the more you restrict competition. The lower you are, the more you remove barriers to competition. So the US is about flat. And you can see that Europe used to be, every single country in Europe was more regulated, less pro-competition in the US in the first vintage of data, which was collected in the, uh, around 95, 96 and published 98. With one exception, of course, and you can guess, I'm sure, what this green dot here at the bottom is. Yeah, that's the UK. 
Okay, the only country in Europe that had a traditional free market and independent regulators was the UK. But everybody else was clearly not in the same ballpark. But over time, they learned the lesson. Okay, and it's not by chance because we looked at what happened in the US. We saw that the market was working well for everybody, in particular for the middle class. And we started emulating, copying these ideas. And slowly but surely, Europe drifted towards a level where today many markets are actually just as free as they are in the US. Um, so as the US was moving backward on its, and in, in fact, in, to some extent, you could say that the US was forgetting its own history. Um, Europe was benefiting from the insights in the US to apply to their own market to make them more consumer friendly. So if you put all the pieces together uh, and to conclude, I just want to give you some numbers to keep in mind, just to show we clear about the magnitude of what we're talking about. So my estimate is that uh, the, the, the median household in the US pays an extra $300 per month in pure rent to monopolies. Okay, that means that if you think about your benchmark household in the US, they should get $300 extra dollars in their pocket at the end of each month uh, if the markets had remained competitive. Uh, this, by the way, I should emphasize, this does not take into account the big ripoff in the healthcare system because that's so complicated that it's not even in my benchmark analysis. So this is for everything else, that's the telecom, energy, transport, and stuff like that. Um, so $300 per month per household, that's about $600 billion per year for all the household, okay, for over 12 months for all the households. That's the amount of rent that the households pay to monopolies in the US each year. Um, if then you think about what would happen if we could dial back the clock to 2000 to bring back competition, in these markets in the US, then my estimate is that private GDP would go up by $1 trillion. Um, and in fact, you would also have some redistribution because by making markets more competitive, you tend to shrink profit margins, meaning you shrink payment to shareholders or capital income, and you increase labor income even more. So in fact, you would have an increase of labor income by $1.25 trillion and total payment to shareholders, total capital income would go down by about $250 billion. So more competition would mean more money for the middle class and less, uh, relatively less for uh, capital owners, so a reduction in inequity in, in that sense. Now, these are relatively large numbers, just uh, to give you a sense. For, for the median household in the US who earns about $50,000 per month, that would be about the total impact, once you factor in all the good stuff coming with competition, the total income would be about uh, $5,000 extra per year. So it's about a 10% increase in their standards of living for the, for the median household, okay? For the very rich, it's a bit different because they lose more from the, from the profits. Uh, but for the middle class who's relies, who relies on uh, labor income, this would be uh, almost a 10% increase in their standard of living. So this is why I think it's important to bring back competition to the US. And I said I would not be too long, so that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, my uh, internet connection may be having a slight problem. Um, uh, well, let's let's go straight from there to uh, the current environment and the current crisis. Uh, we've seen in the stock market some of the biggest tech companies; their valuations have been rising despite this uh, recession. Uh, is this inevitably something that is going to make these very large, very powerful companies more so? Ah, uh, great question. So uh, yes, but it's not hopeless. So uh, the thing that's for sure is that um, SMEs are going to be hit harder. So we already see it in the data. The predicted failures of SMEs is extremely high, not just in the US, everywhere. So one major policy challenge going forward is uh, how to deal with this wave of coming insolvencies for small firms. Um, and that's going to be true in Europe, that's going to be true in the US, and we have to deal with it. If we don't, then we're going to kill even more small firms, so we're going to have even more concentration. Um, then you have the other connected but somewhat different issue, which is, as it turns out, the firms that were already dominant uh, three months ago are also the firms that happen to be best positioned to deal with COVID because they can do all their business online. And so therefore, the biggest winners by far are Microsoft and Amazon. Why? Because they are running the cloud and because Amazon can deliver at home. So by far, they are the biggest winner. And soon, close behind, you have Apple because Apple could you know, also do most of its stuff online. 
Now, this didn't have to be that way. If instead of a COVID crisis, we had a massive uh, you know, cyber attack crisis, probably would have been reversed. This guy would have been the worst hit. But it so happens that essentially the COVID crisis was good for them. Um, now, I don't think it's necessarily a disaster because in the specific case of Amazon and Microsoft, yeah, they are dominant, but the retail sector is still pretty competitive. Uh, the cloud could remain so to some extent. Um, I think that the, the, the big mistake to avoid is to, because we have the COVID crisis, to relax some of the regulations against antitrust, which sometimes is a temptation in a post-crisis world. Uh, and I think in that case, that's the mistake we want to, uh, to avoid. So is part of the dynamic here that, uh, you know, in the financial system, the, the strategy so far, the Federal Reserve is throwing money at corporate bonds, uh, stocks, the stock market isn't down all that much. Uh, is there something happening in the financial system and the nature of this uh, kind of bailout crisis response that it might fuel those, those the concentration phenomenon? Yeah, it's possible. But so one reason why, if you think of, if you look at historically, small businesses always fare worst than big businesses in, in, in recessions and even more so in deep recessions. Why is that? Three things. The first is they start with less cash on their balance sheet. So they have less liquidity, all right? Less of a buffer to deal with the shock. The second is that they also have less tools to access liquidity. Small firms rely on banks. If you're a big firm, you have the banks, but you have the commercial paper market and you have the bond market. And it turns out that for the Federal Reserve, for instance, it's very easy to intervene in the commercial paper market and in the bond market. They can literally just get out there and buy the stuff, okay? Until they have no limit. So until they get to the price point that they find is good, which means they have a channel and that's the same is true in Europe with the ECB. The central banks have a direct channel, almost like a one-to-one -one channel to help large firms. They can stabilize the market immediately, overnight, the market that matters for the big firms. They can't do the same for the small firms. They can't do the same for like, 10 million small loans. So that's the second reason why the small businesses get hit hardest. And the third one is lobbying, because clearly, I mean, you know, you, you see some firms, I mean, um, clearly the, um, some firms are gonna get a bailout. So in Europe, we saw uh, the big uh, national uh, airlines, so like Air France, Lufthansa, they are gonna get their nice little bailout for themselves. In the US, you had a completely surreal idea of bailing out uh, the shell gas industry. It has nothing to do with the crisis, it was already burst before COVID. So of all the things you wanted to do, this is the, probably like the last item on the list. They got their bailout. That's pure lobbying. Okay? And we know that in, in the lobbying game, the small firms lose as well. So it doesn't matter. One of your slides, uh, you, you kind of delineated reasons, you know, the good side of concentration and, and the bad side, right? That there's some industries where having large companies creates economies of scale, creates greater productivity. Um, yep. Does it matter which type of uh, rationale there is for concentration in assessing how the COVID crisis might might affect the, the longer term prospects? Um, to, to make the forecast for the next six months, not really, because I think it's mostly like the fact that uh, it's a liquidity crisis that kills small, small businesses and the firms that are going to do well are the ones that were well positioned earlier. Uh, but if you go beyond six months, yes. For instance, uh, let me give you one example. Um, I think one of the silver lining of the COVID crisis so far is exactly what we are doing right now. We are using Zoom, okay? Now Zoom, six months ago, few people knew it. Today, they have an amazingly large network. In fact, I think Zoom became a, a verb faster than Google did, hmm. right? Remember the first time we said, let's Google it. To me, <laughs> let's do online a search on Google. That let's go shorten. Uh, I think let's Zoom it. It's become a verb in like a matter of three weeks, which means that when we exit this thing, we're going to have a new competitor with a very large platform access to. So that's a competitor for Facebook and Google to some extent. Um, this is the kind of platform we absolutely want to keep independent. So it should be totally clear, I hope, in the regulator's mind that there is no way we would let Google or Facebook buy Zoom. Okay? <laughs> that's a mistake we've done repeatedly in the past. We've done it with WhatsApp. We've done it with Instagram. We've done it with double click. We've done it with ways. Uh, I hope we are not going to repeat that one. So that's that's where it does matter which way you think the concentration is going. So I think about retail. You mentioned smaller enterprises going under. So on the one hand, a company like Walmart is very productive. They're very efficient. They they run stores very effectively. Uh, on the other, if we have this wave of smaller retail bankruptcies that looks very possible, they will become even more dominant in in retail. As you say, retail is a very diverse sector now, but 
Uh, is there a risk that even some of these sectors where uh, there's been concentration for relatively good reasons, benign reasons, might become more problematic if there are mass business failures? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, 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 even if, I mean, the story of antitrust is that uh, there are very few evil people in the world. But there is enough evil people to do evil. But I mean, like most of the thing we see in the data is firms that become dominant, usually it's for the good reason. Usually it's because they did something right. Even like the funny thing, you know, we all go back to Standard Oil, like the 19th century robber baron. But if you look at the actual history of Standard Oil, they were very innovative. They got dominant because they were better than the rest. And in fact, some of their innovation was extremely useful. But at some point, if you become too dominant, you're just too good. And that's that, or too big, sorry. And that's, that's bad uh, in and of itself because it allows you to uh, cheat and uh, you know, tilt the market uh, in your favor. So it's not that firms necessarily have ill intention, it's that if they become too dominant, they will abuse their power at some point. So yes, you have to be worried. In the case of retail, however, the story of Walmart is, I think there's an issue maybe of, you say, of labor practice. There, is, there might be an issue of, broadly speaking, of how we organize cities. And then having only big box retailers, maybe it's bad for, uh, but in terms purely of, of in terms of economics, um, I think you could have been worried about Walmart around 2000, 2005. In fact, many people were at the time. Uh, but just at the time where people started to think Walmart had become too dominant, that's when Amazon came in. And to some extent, the arrival of Amazon solved the Walmart problem. Because now it's clear, I mean, Costco, Amazon, and Walmart are all very good businesses, very strong. And you know they are going to keep competing as far as I can tell for the next few years. We are fine. Um, and smaller businesses, I think the issue is they should also have got their act together a little bit faster. I mean, what I see now, I think people have noticed it in many smaller regions, smaller communities, is that small businesses finally now are getting together to organize uh, online delivery because none of them individually has enough. Uh, firepower to maintain a large distribution network. But if they team up, they can. And I think it's great that it's happening now, but it's also, they could have done that earlier. So how do you rate the, the, uh, the government response so far to, to this crisis? Do, do, are the policies that are being put in place uh, adequate to the challenge the, the economy is facing both in the US and, and in Europe? Um, well, so the first thing that's striking is the, the vast differences in outcomes, at least so far, uh, around the world. Um, and, you know, if you compare the, the, the results in Korea, Germany versus France, the US versus Italy and Spain, it's very different. Um, now, I think some of these differences might decrease a little bit over time. The way that if you look at the data today, uh, it looks like... Um, Korea and Germany are clearly on, on a good trajectory, um, uh, relatively. Both. Um, the US and France look just exactly the same. Like, I think the forecast now is that on a per capita basis, we're going to have exactly the same death rate in the next six months. Um, and in terms of economic outcomes, it looks the same to me as well. And then some countries have done worse, like uh, Italy or Spain to some extent. Um, so there's a wide variance. Um, I think that. Uh, most of it, some of it is luck, uh, because you could have a, like a severe, out, severe outbreak that you didn't see, um, and so some of it is luck. But a lot of it is the difference that was the first two or three weeks as soon as you became aware of uh, the pandemic, and the decision they were taken very early on. The, where the U.S. totally messed up was uh, in March. You know, by April, everything is done already. Uh, so it's these few weeks where we know the threat is coming and, the, and some critical people in the administration uh, don't understand what's going on and don't, and don't react strongly enough. That's where uh, all the disaster happens. Um, now, if you step back and you think about it, I definitely in my lifetime, this is by far the most devastating crisis from the perspective of, uh, say, Europe or the US. Because uh, I think that... Uh, um, you know, if you think about one symbol of a shift towards the East uh, in terms of uh, economic and political uh, power, this has to be it. 
because for the first time, the, the US is not at all leading the response. In fact, it's kind of lagging. Uh, the country ahead of the curve is China. And, um, and you know, we, throughout history, we learned the, the history of uh, European, uh, you know, conquest abroad as bringing germs and steel. You know, that's how we conquest, like we kill people by bringing weapons and by bringing and diseases. Like that's the history of, of European conquest uh, all around the world. And for the first time, it's kind of reversed. Uh, I think that's a very strong symbol of uh, a big sea change in, in global politics, yeah, for sure. So is this era of globalization over? Or are we looking at a different uh, kind of form of, of world trade and world interconnection in the, in the decades ahead? That seems very likely, yes, because um, for, for a couple of reasons. One is, of course, that there were some pre-existing trends. So um, the, the globalization of the 2000s was behind us in any case, because it was predicated on the idea that labor costs were 50% cheaper in China. Well, that's just not true anymore. The Chinese are richer, the wages have gone up, so the, the, the comparative advantage purely in terms of cost is essentially gone. So that gap was driving uh, some of the big box, you know, like the container ship kind of globalization. This is partly gone. Um, now we're gonna have more like uh, what we used to call north to north trade, which is trade between countries of similar levels of development, and which is a bit different. Uh, it's more like we trade specialized goods as opposed to trading big blocks. Um, so that was going to happen in any case. Uh, then COVID accelerated that uh, a lot. And, uh, but it also, again, I think that the silver lining here is that uh, if you look at the, the again, take, think about the big picture. Uh, if you look at the basket of what people actually consume, the share of physical good has been drifting down because we have enough. I mean, I don't need to have more than one or two cars and I don't need to have, you know, the number of physical good I can actually enjoy is limited. Uh, as I get richer, I won't spend more time, uh, you know, time maybe actually free time with my kids, uh, or even leisure or reading, culture and stuff like that. So this was going on already before. Okay, but what's the key difference? Well, the key difference is some of these other goods, some of the other services that we that become relatively more important as become richer, they are harder to trade because uh, they they don't travel on container ships. But that might be changing. I mean, clearly one thing we would like to trade more is health service. If we could have, a, not fully global, but like a more integrated uh, uh, world for health services where you could do an online uh, you know, uh, appointment with a doctor anywhere in the world, that could be a good thing. Now, this was a, totally like a pipe dream three months ago. Today, I don't know. We may see more of that. So some of this, the services that uh, we would like to trade more uh, maybe that's going to happen through uh, uh, internet uh, connections. Like people seem to be becoming more and more comfortable with that. Right. Seems like there's a, a tension, a co contradiction between, uh, on the one hand, we see the value of interconnection and in the entire world working together to try and solve something like this. On the other hand, a crisis like this makes some leaders focus inward and some countries focus inward. Uh, and seeing which of those trends is more powerful seems like a big question for the future. True, but I mean, it's also, I mean, it's the first time that we, we hit the crisis in a world without a leader. That hasn't happened. I mean, we had the bipolar uh, world order post-World War II with the USSR and the US. So um, it was bipolar in that sense. Um, and then after 1990, we had the decade, decades actually of un, uh, unrestricted US power. Unrestricted is too strong, but you know, there was one hyperpower and that's it. There was no question to be asked. If there was a global problem, the global problem would be discussed in Washington and maybe not solved in Washington, but nothing would happen pretty much unless Washington had some, in, some guidance, at the very least guidance, or oftentimes just decisions. Um, it's the first time that we have a global crisis where there's just no leader. Um, and so that's something which is new. That's going to change the game for sure going forward. Um, now, whether it's going to change it permanently or not, that I don't know. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. I think that nothing is irreversible. Um, in fact, amazingly enough, the Chinese managed to overplay their hand almost like, as quickly as uh, they gained some leadership. You know, like, uh, so they went from um, being clearly like a potential leader to vastly overplaying their hand 
you know, not behaving in a way which is consistent with, the, you know, what you would expect from a leader and losing all the credit they had accumulated the, the, the months before. So this is kind of reversed very quickly. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that uh, we're going to be in a world where the U.S. is not the leader anymore. But clearly, uh, you know, something is going to have to change in Washington if we want to go back to the older world. So back on the, uh, the ideas around corporate concentration, uh, your book came out last year. Uh, I know firsthand many influential people have been reading it and, and, and listening to you on these ideas. Uh, do, you, do you think uh, you're winning the battle on this? Are, are, uh, are American political leaders starting to, to feel like uh, you know, American industry is too concentrated and this creates problems for the economy as a whole? Mm, mm, I think, it's, I think uh, the battle is just beginning. Um, I mean, you, you know you win the battle when you see that the lobbyists are getting worried. And they are not worried yet. <laughs> uh, they are shameless. Uh, you could see as soon as the government announced the big uh, bailout program, they lined up for all kinds of aid from Washington, and they clearly didn't perceive any shame in asking for money. Like the airlines, that was one example, but there's many others. <clears throat> so, no, I think it's too early to tell. Um, there are a couple of, I think, um, positive signs or encouraging signs. I mean, one of them would be that, in, I tried to write the book in, in a very uh, bipartisan way, trying to just, you know, make the case that competition is a public good and that everybody should agree that's good. Um, and this, to a large extent, was true in the US uh, in the past uh, century, since Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, there were differences, but there was a core set of principles that the Republicans and the Democrats agreed on. And that's how you could get uh, cases like a, a IBM or AT&T, which dragged on for so many years, you know, over so many uh, administrations. So if you think about that, if at that time, uh, every new administration's only goal was to undo what the previous one did, then nothing would happen. Okay? The reason it was uh, somewhat um, you know, uh, efficient at the time was that there was agreement on some core principles that uh, the right and the left could agree on. I think that to me is like the ultimate goal to get back to that. Now, how can you do that? Well, the first thing to notice is that there is a generation gap. Uh, when I listen to the governors of many states, uh, Republicans and Democrats, many of them have relatively, they have overlapping interests and overlapping ideas. At the local level, things are a lot less dysfunctional than, at the, than in Washington. And I think partly it's an age issue, to be perfectly honest. I think the governors are a bit younger on average, and so they are a bit more attuned. It's partly it's a feedback from, from the electorate, where the direct feedback is stronger at the state level. And so at the end of the day, I do see some encouraging sign there that uh, there will be space for some bipartisan support for, for something on, along these lines at the state level. Washington, it's complicated, because the power of lobbies is so strong that I think it's gonna, that's going to be an uphill battle. Uh, let's go to your questions now. If you can either uh, use the reaction button to, to indicate you'd like to, to ask something, uh, or I will try to, if you're on video wave, I can uh, unmute you that way. Uh, and we'll see who wants to chime in. Uh, let's see. And, um, I can make this work. Uh, Sorry, I just saw somebody. There we go. Uh, and uh, uh, Vinny? Yeah, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Thomas, thank you so much for this great conversation. Um, I was very uh, interested in the bad concentration, you know, presentation you made, especially in the telecom sector. Wanted to ask you about Altis and their attempt to really go after the big telecom companies here in the U.S. It sounds like it's been a failure. What would be the reasons for them not managing to achieve what they've done in Europe? You know, they tried the mobile, the yeah. new mobile service at a very low cost. I don't see anything happening on that front. I don't know what happened. Why did they fail? Yeah, so, um, so the telecom industry is, uh, is particular in the sense that it's not always easy to enter. Um, and so, you, first of all, you have to separate the broadband 
connection at home versus uh, wireless. Broadband is a tiny bit easier to enter because you can start local, right? That means if you, if you want to provide a lower cost broadband access in the US, you can do it first in, a, uh, in some part of California and, and if successful, expand slowly. So this has been happening a little bit more. Uh, and the reason is you can, you can enter local and start to grow. Um, and uh, there, I think the issue is the, um, is the last, what we used to call the last mile or, you know, like the direct connection at your home where it's a complete, it's a complete mess. It's usually an overlapping regulation between state and municipalities and nobody knows exactly who's supposed to pay what to whom. And so it's, I think that's the main issue. In Europe, the, the reason the broadband costs are very low is because uh, there is essentially one cable get to each house, but then that cable is shared to some extent. So you, you have virtual operators who provide relatively local services and that's, how, that's what keeps the market competitive. To do that, you would need the regulators to step in. Um, I think it's up to the municipality and I think they are the ones who should get their act together. For the wireless, that's different because wireless, you know, it's very, it's very hard to imagine that you could enter the US market without having some coverage of the, the entire US. Like nobody would buy a cell phone uh, plan that would only cover a few cities, right? So that means either you don't enter or you enter with coverage, uh, global coverage all at once. That's very hard. That's ex essentially impossible unless the regulatory uh, authorities decide to give you some spectrum to start with. And typically that you would have to rent from the existing player. So when Free Mobile entered uh, the French market, uh, we forced the uh, old uh, oligopoly to rent out some of their uh, spectrum for a year or two to give them time to build their own network. If you don't do that, it's very hard to enter. It's like a full barrier to entry. So I think that's the reason. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, Mehdi Asprey. Uh, Mehdi, you should be, you are thank unmuted you. now. Thank you, Neil. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, perhaps at the um, back of Anne's question, you illustrated the, um, the market behavior in the United States with regard to the broadband internet and you had that very interesting um, uh, slide. Can I, and, and, and some of us who visit the United States have all encountered the uh, uh, difficulties and horror stories with regard to trying to get um, a temporary access um, to internet and to mobile, etc. I can I can see that. But have you looked at it in other spheres, manufacturing spheres, car market, or retail, or food market? Would the example that you gave, which was quite stark, but would that actually apply to the other spheres rather than that particularly concentrated? internet broadband uh, market Thank yeah you. so um uh, in the re to the retail sector that we were discussing with neil uh, a bit earlier is still very competitive in the us uh, because you have uh, walmart and and, uh, and uh, amazon are really competing head on very strongly costco is not far behind you have a couple of other retail chains that are competing strongly so the retail sector is still very competitive, wholesale trade, same story. Uh, we, we see some concentration there, but it looks very efficient. Um, and then um, the ones that have uh, changed, sometimes what happened is Europe, sometimes um, I think like take car manufacturing, for instance. I don't think car manufacturing has become less competitive in the US. It's just become a lot more in Europe because since we opened the border, we have a single market. Uh, this, this has become really competitive. But car prices, I don't think, are very different. If there is any difference in car price today, it's probably due to taxes. I don't think uh, the, the basic prices are not that different. So that, that's the market, for example, which I don't think is much better in Europe. It's globally competitive. Um, it's it's uh, tend to be the market where uh, it's more local, so you don't have so, so much competition from abroad, and the markets where regulations matter a lot. So, at the state level, um, some of the hopeful sign I see is people understanding that they have licensing requirements in some state that simply make no sense. And then uh, there was a couple of examples in recent years where they removed some of the licensing requirements and realized, well, it works better without them. Okay, so that's, I think that's where the, 
the big distinction is. Uh, Neil, I wonder if I can do a follow-up, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I hope I don't appear rude, but the question that Neil asked you earlier, Thomas, with respect to the actions taken in the United States or in Europe, I believe it was with regard to the economical assistance, the steps that has been taken several trillion in the United States and also in the United Kingdom and, and other um, uh, European countries. I, I, oh, yeah. I, I, I believe you actually addressed essentially what is actually happening with re regard to the health aspect, with regard yes, to the yes. last gun, etc. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, so, I, yeah, I wonder, it's true. I, as I said, if I don't appear I, rude, the... I wonder if you can actually address uh, <laughs> Neil's question. Absolutely. So, yeah, so the, I was focused more on the health response. The, uh, so, for the economic response, it's um, it's relatively similar in spirit. In fact, it's extremely similar in spirit. Broadly speaking, uh, if you look at the intervention around the world, you have two big things. You have credit to SMEs and firms in general, and then you have support for the labor market. Uh, now, the details matter uh, a lot in this thing. So uh, the difference that you see in practice, they are not differences in, um, in terms of the, um, the spirit of what, firm, of what countries are trying to do. That's very similar, actually. The goals, the structure is very similar, but it's the implementation that's very different. And so it's more like a plumbing problem. So in other words, take, uh, so Germany was very successful in 08. The, the crisis that uh, Neil uh, wrote about, uh, the, the last one, the, final, the, the big financial crisis of 08 and 09, Germany was very successful at uh, implementing a program of Kurzarbeit, which is short employment, so that people don't get fired, you just put them on, on temporary uh, short employment where the state pays the wage bill. And then when you, the, the economy restarts, the guys start working again, okay? That was very successful. So everybody in Europe decided that they wanted to copy that. And so all the countries in Europe today have some program that looks very much like Kurzarbeit. That's true for France, Italy, essentially all over Europe. Now, if you look at the US, this is not the way it's done usually in the US. So in the US, typically it's, you have temporary layoffs, uh, which is the thing that we saw spike uh, in recent years, in recent weeks, uh, temporary layoffs. And then you have uh, some, the payment protection program, which is loans to businesses so they can keep their workers that turn into grants. So these are like a web, this is like just like a web subsidy. But if you think about it in the big picture, this is very similar to uh, what France and Germany are trying to do, just as a different name. So the, the big picture architecture is exactly the same. And the differences you see in the data, they are about implementation. Uh, and then here, what's striking again is, is the fact that the SBA, just the rollout of the program in the US was very not very efficient. So people were waiting forever to get their loans. You also had the big backlog in the banking system that prevented small businesses from getting the loans. And you got to a point where, you know, small businesses in Switzerland uh, could log in the government website in the morning and they would get the money in their bank account in the afternoon. And in the US, you had to wait for three weeks to get a, a response. Okay, so I think the bug there was in the, uh, in the implementation, not so much in the, the spirit of the US. Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, raise your hand if you uh, would like to ask a question. In the meantime, uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, if, so if a senator calls you up tomorrow and wants to ask, uh, how in doing all these rescue packages can we avoid a world where this results in even more concentrated major industries? Uh, what are things the government can be doing now to try and avoid a situation where this crisis leads to an even acceleration of the trends that you've been describing? Well, so the first thing you need to do is to, when you, when you, if you want a, a, a program that, that targets small and medium-sized firms, you need to uh, earmark some of the fund for these guys. So, because if you make it, if it's a common pool, then the small firms are always going to lose because they're always going to be slower at reaching the, the money because they don't have the same lawyers, don't have the same contact with their banks. So if you want to help the small businesses, you need to put the money aside for them. Don't, like, don't make them compete with the big firms. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, you want to always use a two-pronged approach. So for the, for the small businesses, you really want to think of uh, loans or help that, are, that is not going to then overburden them with debt later on. So it's always better to give them 
something that can turn into equity, uh, something that can turn into something like a preferred stock, uh, rather than just pure loans that's going to uh, maybe help them in the short term, but then they're going to be over indebted after the crisis. So that's kind of on the small small firm side. On the big firm side, I think the, the key is to, uh, to be uh, very vigilant with respect to merger and acquisitions, because I think that some of the big firms are going to be the ones with a lot of cash in their pockets, and they're going to be look, looking around to buy uh, small firms that they find it attractive. And that may sometimes be a good idea, but there's going to be a lot of opportunistic behavior, so that's why you want to watch out. Nearing the end, uh, one other question. Um, how much of, of the phenomenon you're describing of what's happened over the last 20 years in the U.S. is uh, is a story of political power and, and kind of lobbying and, and influence in Washington that has... Uh, that has allowed these trends to take place. Is this fundamentally a story of corruption or is this fundamentally a story of kind of economic change? I think it's always both, you know, like technology and politics always change uh, jointly. Um, it's, it would be silly to argue that the dominance of the big tech firms has nothing to do with technology, right? So uh, on the other hand, it would be naive to think that it has nothing to do with politics. Uh, because they are spending resources in Washington because they don't want to be liable for many of the things they do. Uh, and that, that's how they want to protect their business. So I think it's always a mix of the two. Now, what I find puzzling in the U.S. is that this idea is very old, you know. Um, and so uh, the fight between political power and economic power has always been going on. And I think historically the U.S. had found a way to keep the balance it's not never perfect, but there was some sense that it was balanced. And then if you look at the data, somewhere in the 2000s, it started to drift. Uh, as if some like anchor was removed and then the whole ship was drifting away slowly, but in a way which was not controlled. And now what changed in the 2000s, that's hard to know. Uh, I think 9-11 and the big impact. I mean, clearly as a proxy cause for the airlines, it's very clear. That's how we, the, the mergers, the merger wave in the airlines, I think is a direct consequence of 9-11. Um, and the, maybe the first merger, maybe the first two mergers would have been justified. The other ones were pure political rent seeking. Um, for the political system, it's clear that you see the big rise in political donations in campaigns, the big increase in the cost of running a successful campaign. So that today it's very hard to imagine how you could run a successful uh, campaign without taking large uh, donation from corporations. That's relatively new too. Um, and I think all these things combine to give like structurally more weight to big firms in the political process in, in Washington. Now, I don't think it's irreversible, uh, but um, you know, it's, uh, it's something that uh, unfortunately, I think it, it's not like a, a fluke. It's not like a one-time event. I think it's a slow, slow drift. Well, that is uh, about all the time we have. Uh, such a stimulating discussion, and, and thank you, uh, uh, Toma. Thank you to the uh, consulate, and uh, hope uh, we all learned a lot about how the U.S. economy and corporate structure is changing, and uh, what the future may hold in this uh, era of crisis. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Toma. And uh, we definitely enjoy listening to you today. It was. Very insightful. Really, thank you for being with us today, and uh, uh, hope we'll we'll see you soon and again, and uh, all the participants. So you all have a great day and uh, and stay safe. Thank Most you very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye bye.